Nikki, it's really pushing in. Nikki, it's really pushing in. Oh, it stopped. The water with the wind is pushing, the water is pushing all this up here. Look at it. You know how long it's going to take to melt over? It sounds like a train. Last night it sounds like a tornado going through.
Ganti dong ya, Pak! your county you may have yeah a number of our viewers contacted us about the explosions that sounded like sonic booms and the sheriff's office was flooded with calls on sunday nbc2's rick ritter found out what it was shock waves sent throughout collier county it was definitely uh the equivalency of a sonic boom east naples resident kevin heisler had never heard anything like it i was out back with my wife sitting on an eye and all of a sudden just boom these boom-like noises are the talk of the town, ones that just about everyone heard on Sunday. I kind of heard a slight rumble, and then I heard a louder rumble, and then my window started to shake. The Collier County Sheriff's Office says they've received dozens of phone calls around 11 a.m., one after another. Collier County Sheriff's Office, Deputy Sheriff's Office, how may I help you? I live on 3rd Avenue Southwest, and about 15 minutes ago there was a huge explosion. It like shook our sliders and shook part of our house. All asking the same question. Two loud booms we heard coming southwest of Marco Island. Is that sonic booms or someone blasting? Less than two weeks ago, the Naval Air Station in Key West had jets training over the Gulf, something that contributed to the earth shaking. But representatives say they had no training on Sunday. Many thought it could have been blasting. Minto Communities, a company developing the new Isles of Collier Preserve in East Naples, has a permit, but officials there say they only blast during the week. I heard two blasts living down on Marco Island on Sunday, and those have nothing to do with anything that we're doing up in Naples. With both jet training and blasting out of the question, Sunday's earth-rattling noise remains a mystery for now. It is what it is. In Collier County, Rick Ritter, NBC2. Submerged tombs in Leeville, Louisiana, give new meaning to the expression, a watery grave. Piles of barnacle-covered bricks washing away in the lapping water. All that remains of a family cemetery in the small coastal town. All over South Louisiana, you have these little family plots. That people uh, had their family members uh, build there. Many as 20 or 30 uh, grave sites, some as many as 60, uh, built on high land. Wendell Curall manages the South Lafouche Levy District. He's also a descendant of those who once called Leeville home. His ancestors buried here at the Crosby family plot, a patch of crumbling graves along Highway 1 enclosed by a rusty chain link fence. Little protection against the environmental threats that inch closer every year. The graveyard was in the shade of oak trees, and now you, you, can't, you don't see an oak in sight. All you see is marsh and open water. Ten years ago, the family cemented over the graveyard, hoping to preserve whatever was left. But as you can see from the broken tombstones and grave markers, it offered little protection 
against the rising waters. Over the past century, the town has subsided roughly three feet and lost another from rising sea levels. The cause? Our intricate levee system that prevents flooding. Sediment that built up the delta over 5,000 years now dumps right into the gulf. As the coastline erodes from hurricanes and storms, there's nothing to build it back up. Adding on to those problems is that we've cut channels that allows the Gulf of Mexico to get closer to us. We've lost our marsh barriers, we've lost our natural chenyas, our oak ridge barriers. All these things help keep some of the energy from storms away from us. As a result, Cural says the coastline is now 30 to 40 miles closer to the residents of South Louisiana. Families like his own are forced to move further inland with each generation. And it's like most deltas throughout the world. You always have great risk and, and great opportunity. And in this place, you have the extreme of both of them. We have tremendous truck traffic, we have tremendous tug traffic and, and barge traffic, and yet the risk are taking even the graves away. In the case of Kural's family plot and the other small graveyards dotting Leeville, that risk has taken its toll. You're not only losing your past, but you're losing your future, you're losing everything. Once a town of 60, only two families now call Leeville home. Eventually, they too will move to higher ground as they watch the memories of their ancestors sinking before their very eyes. Today is February 14, 2014, on a Friday. It's 4.41 a.m. Pacific Time. And pink here. Great Lakes ice cover is the largest we've seen this century.
This is by John Erdman, and it's published February 8, 2014. MODIS satellite image of the Great Lakes on February 7, 2014. Bright white in this image shows mainly clouds over the Great Lakes. However, you can see lake ice in southern and western Lake Michigan, southern Lake Superior, and far western Lake Erie. And this is a Google Earth image. One effect of the persistently cold winter of 2013 to 2014 is showing up on the world's largest group of freshwater lakes. According to an analysis by NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory, ice covered 78.7 percent of the Great Lakes on February 6. Not since early 1996 has ice been so widespread on the Great Lakes. This is an abrupt turnaround from the past four winters, during which the peak ice coverage remained around 40% or less. As you can see in the graph below, the 40-year average is just over 51%. Great Lakes Annual Maximum Ice Coverage, 1973 to 2013. Yearly peak Great Lakes Ice Coverage percent from 1973 to 2013 by NOAA. Dating to 1973, the two years with the largest ice coverage were 1979 and 1994, 90.7%. When looking at individual lakes, just over 92% of Lake Superior, just under 88% of Lake Huron, almost 95% of Lake Erie and around 53% of Lake Michigan is ice covered. Much deeper Lake Ontario is only about 29% of ice covered. As a result, caves near the Apostle Islands National Lakeshore are now open to foot traffic thanks to sufficiently thick ice on Lake Superior. And you can see the ice on Lake Michigan in that photo as far as you can see to the horizon in February 2014. Winter weather expert for the Weather Channel, Tom Niziol noted the current Great Lakes ice cover was pacing quite close to that from early February 1977, another year in which the peak ice cover topped 90%. And here's the ice cover comparison for the first week of February 2014 versus 1977. Alright, and I'm not able to enlarge that photo unfortunately. Okay, folks, we're going to proceed on to this ice cover comparison. All right, and this is on Twitter. I'm not going to enlarge it for now. It's probably too hard to do. But let's compare the current ice cover to the early February ice cover in the two standard bearing years mentioned above. And those are the percentages. So we're pacing ahead of 1990, or 1979, pardon me, but behind 1994. Will the cold persist to allow the ice to continue to spread? Though most of the upcoming week, temperatures will remain generally much colder than average over the Midwest and Northeast. Beyond that, there are some preliminary indications the cold may finally ease up the following week, but that outlook remains too uncertain at this time. And here's a special thanks to Dr. Matt Sitskowski, Science and Weather Coordinator at the Weather Channel for research help with this piece. And this looks like a photo gallery of ice. My goodness, look at that. The St. Joseph, Michigan outer light covered with a thick coating of ice on January 26, 2013 by Tom Gill. And I don't take credit for any of these photos. They belong to the person indicated under the photo. The St. Joseph, Michigan outer range light is covered in a thick layer of twisted ice on December 20, 2010. And another one of the Michigan Lighthouse. After a winter storm that created 20-foot waves on Lake Michigan, the St. Joseph, Michigan Lighthouse is seen covered in ice, December 20, 2010. And another one by Tom Gill. Okay, that's a nice 
a lighthouse covered in ice. And the same one covered in ice. It's amazing. Looks like all these photos are by Tom Gill. There's 28 photos, uh, folks, so. Another one. <clears throat> Pardon me. I'm just breathing through these. This is number 12. This is a close up of the ice. Another perspective of it. There you are. Looks very, very cold, doesn't it? Ice starts to form on the St. Joseph, Michigan Outer Light on February 12, 2012. This is from 2009. A thick layer of ice glazes the supports for the catwalk, leading to the St. Joseph, Michigan Lighthouse. We're on photo number 23 right now. It's a close-up picture. It's number 26. All by Tom Gill. Look from directly below the arch formed by the ice. Dagger-like icicles hang down from the outer lighthouse. Wow. And this is the last photo of the dagger icicles. Interesting. Okay. I think that's going to do it. Here's a little video from the Weather Channel. You might want to check that out. Okay. On the left, 2014 total ice cover 78.7%. This is a Great Lakes coastal forecasting system. And I'm going to move the viewing window over to the right now. And on the right, you see the total ice cover 79.1%. And there's a color key right here that you can uh, check out for the ice chart. All right, folks, that's going to do it for this report. Thanks for watching and please stay safe. Pink up.
Nikki, it's really pushing in. Oh, it stopped. doing this? Because the water's moving. The lake opened up, see? So the water with the wind is pushing, the water's pushing all this up here. Look at it. You know how long it's going to take to melt over? It sounds like a train. Last night it sounded like a tornado going through. That is crazy. I wonder how they're going to stop it. I don't want to go. Definitely bust straight shot in. Nikki, it's really pushing in. It's gonna shatter the window. Oh, oh, it stopped. It's not gonna stop though. Why? How is it doing this? Because the water's moving. The lake opened up. See? So the water with the wind. It's pushing, the water's pushing all this up here. Look at it. You know how long it's going to take to melt over? It sounds like a train. Last night it sounded like a tornado going through. That is crazy. I wonder how they're going to stop it. I don't want to go. Definitely bust straight shot in. At least I have some bushes. Nikki, it just busted through a door over here! All the way through, the door is caving! Look at that! Casas completamente destruidas que se traducen en millonarias pérdidas. Es el drama que viven los habitantes de Oak Beach en la provincia canadiense de Manitoba debido a un verdadero tsunami de nieve que arrasó con las construcciones de ese lugar. Vientos de hasta 80 kilómetros por hora provocaron el levantamiento de una capa de hielo desde un lago su rápido avance impactó directamente a las casas de Oak Beach. En algunas zonas, la nieve alcanzó los 9 metros de altura y se coló al interior de las viviendas, dejando a sus habitantes con lo opuesto. Muchas de las familias afectadas no contaban con seguros y habían sufrido el mismo episodio en 2011. Massive sinkhole en Bayou Corn are inches away from seeping into the freshwater bayou. A protection levy built to keep that material in the sinkhole is sinking. This is Adrian Pittman gets answers on what could happen if the protection wall gives way. Assumption Parish officials fear the break in the berm could cause major environmental damage in the area, leaving them on high alert. Another year and the same problems in Bayou Corn. 
It's a little bit frustrating that, you know, all this time has elapsed and uh, here we are. We're still, still worried about the sinkhole. A growing sinkhole, continuous seismic activity, and cracks in the protection berm around the sinkhole. There's still a lot of things going on way below the surface of the earth where we can't really tell what's going on. Uh, if that south berm is still subsiding, still cracking, that means something's happening down below. Since last week, activity along the sinkhole has stopped because increased amounts of micro earthquakes. Because of those small quakes, the protection wall is dropping into the sinkhole. Into the sinkhole. At this point, you would think we'd have a clearer picture in our mind as far as what to expect expect in the future, but uh, that future is still uh, very cloudy right now. Since October, the berm has dropped a total of four feet, and within the last week, it's dropped a foot alone, leaving residents and officials here in Assumption Parish concerned. The subsidence itself is only about six to eight inches above the water currently. Meaning salt water could eventually creep into the swamp and bayou if nothing is done. Take a look at these pictures. You can see how much the berm has sunk since last week. Uh, environmental risk to vegetation, trees, uh, possibly uh, fish and so forth, and try to avoid that, by, and that's what the containment is for. But residents will remain hopeful in 2014. We hope for the best. We hope we can bring some conclusion to this, but I really think the sinkhole itself, we're going to be dealing with, with that, I think, for years to come. A spokesperson for Texas, Brian, says crews will begin repairing the berm tomorrow, and there are plans in the works to extend the southern berm so it won't continue to subside. Adrian Pittman, WBRZ News 2. All right, Adrian, keep it.
What's interesting here is you can see the water flowing under the ice. day for the Assumption Parish sinkhole. This is early this morning. Parish workers discovered water and debris moving inside the containment berm area. Parish officials tell WABS Kelsey Davis this latest activity gives some insight into what's still going on below the surface. In this video shot early this morning by Assumption Parish emergency workers, you can see water, debris, and one side of the containment berm moving back and forth. The uh, sediment, some of the other things are shifting down through that damaged rock zone to the underground area. You saw the water, you saw the big water shift back and forth. And uh, we've seen similar events happen in the past when you've seen a, a big shift of material down there. The Blue Ribbon Commission, created at the request of Governor Bobby Jindal and made up of scientists from around the world, is conducting an evaluation of the sinkhole separate from state agencies. One of the things that we've asked them to look at is to get a grasp of the stability now and be able to make good predictions of what it will be in the future. Patrick Courage with the Department of Natural Resources says the commission still has not been able to come up with a reasonable prediction of what could happen. Assumption Parish Office of Emergency Preparedness Director John Boudreaux says this morning's sinkhole activity shows just how much more information all agencies involved need to find out before lifting the 11-month-long mandatory evacuation order. Some of the estimates of just to uh, remove the gas to a safe level, it's going to take years to do at its current rate. So uh, no time in the near future uh, would any, anything be changing here. While state officials and the commission know how difficult this year has been for Bayou Corn residents, they want to take their time gathering as much data as possible. In Assumption Parish, Kelsey Davis, WAFB, 9 News. Texas Brine spokesperson Sonny Cranch says this activity is all a normal part of the sinkhole. Well, emergency managers from the coastal parishes met in Lake Charles today to discuss the potential of a tsunami in the Gulf of Mexico. Although it is a rare event, there is a credible threat for a tsunami to impact coastal Louisiana. As a part of Tsunami Awareness Week, the National Weather Service is showing emergency officials the risks associated with a tsunami and helping them create a plan to deal with such an event. A low probability event, but a very high impact event. So a lot of people are not aware that there's a tsunami hazard along the, the Gulf Coast. An underwater landslide poses the biggest threat to create a tsunami in the Gulf, and with little to no warning, emergency managers need a firm plan of action in place. Well, as I said, we have uh, air going both ways. The meaning of this is that between Interstate 25 and Interstate 35, we will have truck routes after the catastrophe that is to come, and that's what this map is about. It's a warning of what is to come. Now, let's take a look at this. Again, we have Interstate 65 with Strike Zone 5 at the top. We have a river going all the way down to strike zone one. There's strike zone three in the middle. If this river represents the Mississippi River, therefore these strike zones would represent parts of the Mississippi River. This would be the upper near the Great Lakes. This would be the New Madrid area or this would represent Louisiana strike zone one. Of course we know what's happening now in Louisiana if you're keeping up with it, which most people are not because the news media is not following this. They're not keeping up with it. But in Strike Zone 1, it's obvious that this is representing Louisiana. And in Louisiana we have the uh, uh, Assumption Paris sinkhole in Bayou Corn, which has now grown to eight acres. And at this time it is bubbling. There is gas and oil bubbling out the size of about an acre. So we're talking about a mega disaster in the process of happening right now in Louisiana. If you live in this area, folks, if you live in within 50 to 100 miles of Bayou Corn, 
I, I highly recommend that you leave that area very soon. I believe that it's going to explode. Uh, I believe that the sinkhole is going to get much larger and it's going to be a disaster of apocalyptic portions. And what's going to lead to eventually is the eroding of the Luan Salt Dome. The Luan Salt Dome is much larger than the state of Texas. And as you can see, it completely covers Louisiana and about one-third of the state of Texas. When this salt layer is compromised, and it already has been compromised through frack teching and other means, but when it's completely compromised, then it'll be just nothing but caverns under the ground, empty spaces, and it will be just a matter of time. It'll be like waiting for the earthquake, the New Madrid earthquake. When it hits, not only will the New Madrid area go, but will, so will a great deal of the Gulf Coast completely collapsing in on itself, forming an inland sea. That's what that sinkhole in Louisiana is. It is the beginning of this calamity that's to come. And the news media is not following it. At least most of the news media, at least the major news outlets. And the reason they're not following it is because if they did, people might begin to wake up and realize that something is up. For, for obvious reasons, they're not following it. Well, when you look at the maps, here is Interstate 65. It goes from Chicago, it goes through Nashville, all the way to Mobile, Alabama. It's just basically skirts the edge, the outer edge of the New Madrid area of the Mississippi River Valley. Now 35, on the other hand, is on the opposite side. It goes through San Antonio, Waco, Fort Worth, Dallas, Oklahoma City. It goes up to Des Moines and then Minneapolis and then all the way up to the Great Lakes. This represents the other side of the New Madrid fault area and it, in fact it is amazing how it all fits in because you see in the map, the Gotham City map, it's giving us, it's basically telling us where the danger zones are going to be and where the safe zones will be. Now there's a third interstate highway that's listed there. It's a very short one. It doesn't last very long, but it's away from all danger. And this is the actual Interstate 35, and it goes from El Paso through to Denver, Colorado, and all up into Montana. And as you know, this is where the elites are building their underground compounds, is in New Mexico and Colorado and other places. Basically, according to the Gotham City map, Interstate 25 is going to be relatively uh, safe. It'll be a safe travel zone, whereas the other areas will not be so safe. Now here is a map, and I've shown the, the interstates, Interstate 25, Interstate 35, and Interstate 65. And I've basically taken the same information from the Gotham City map and transferred it to this map to show you how it should uh, look like. Basically, your strike zones are going to be here and here, the New Madrid Fault area, and down here in Louisiana. The rally points represent places where people will be able to rally and also where government agencies will be rallying like FEMA uh, to check the emergency. Checkpoints represents the idea that along the interstate they will set up checkpoints. So basically it will, it will become militarized because obviously when you have a crisis this big they're going to go to martial law. Well the same is true with 35. You have a rally point at the bottom of 35 and checkpoints also along 35. And everything between 35 and 65 will be the danger zone. And that doesn't mean that everybody that's in between those two highways is going to die. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that everybody's going to be flooded out or whatever. There's going to be danger zones all over the world, actually. You know, The point is, this is the area that is going to be affected the most by the New Madrid earthquake. This is the danger zone. This is the relatively safe zone. And according to the map, free truck routes will be between Interstate 25 
and Interstate 35. But again, we can go back and look, and uh, you can see from the original map, truck routes, yes, truck routes are 35 and 25, with the two arrows pointing both ways, showing that travel will be free along those routes, but not around 65. 65 is going to have a lot of trouble, but nevertheless, 65 will be the edge of the danger zone. So, where do we go with this? Well, we look at the NAFTA superhighway map and we see how clearly it all lays out. Obviously, they're building this NAFTA superhighway right here on Interstate 35 uh, because they anticipate the crisis to come. They're getting ready for it and so everything is geared towards that. And of course you can see how closely it resembles this map. Do you see the you see the similarities? It's it's obvious that this is something that is a planned event. Now, there is bubbling in Bayou Corn right now in Louisiana. Huge bubbling in the sinkhole and in other areas all over that area. And to, to ignore this catastrophe and say that there's nothing to it is simply to be blinded. And there's no reason to be blinded by this. This is real what we need to do is to make preparation because it could very well be that this will be the future map of North America or something similar to it. Now I've told you that Hollywood and the entertainment industry are continuously bombarding us with predictive programming. In the movie 10.5 we know for a fact that they were hinting at the flooding of the New Madrid Fault. Why would they do that? Because it's part of their plan. And they're using HARP and frac teching to do this with. Look at the fracking that's been going on, the gas production. Look at Louisiana. It's almost completely covered. Uh, a lot of Texas is covered as well. Don't assume that just because you're on the other side of 35 that you're safe. <laughs> we don't know what's coming exactly. We have an idea. We can look at the map and see what they're doing and how they're destroying our environment, how they're destroying this earth. And there's really no reason for it. It's all for greed. It's all for selfish greed. And we need to wake up and realize that the people who are running this country are not our good buddies. They're not our friends. They're the enemy. They've, they've even made it obvious that we are at war with them. They, uh, they create crises after crises and expect us to listen to them, such as Sandy Hook. Well, that was a Manchurian candidate, obviously. But you know what? They also have paid actors to pretend to be the grieving uh, fathers and mothers of these children that were killed in that school shooting. What, what kind of people are these? And what about the state of Louisiana? The big question mark now is not how much money Louisiana is going to lose. or The big question about Louisiana is, is it even going to exist in the coming weeks and months? Is it even going to exist? based on the Louisiana sinkhole, based on the Luan salt layer being compromised by the BP oil disaster and now the uh, sinkhole plus the frac teching, I would say that people live in Louisiana need to get out now. But don't assume that just because you're in Texas you're safe. When this salt dome collapses, when this salt dome collapses, there's going to be an immense tidal wave. And that tidal wave is going to reach to, before it's stopped, about 900 foot elevation. You need to be about 900 feet above sea level in order to be safe. This is uh, what is called the Balconies Escarpment. The Balconies Escarpment. Uh, you need to be on this other side of this Balconies Escarpment. 
Now, 875 feet is about the extent of the balcony's escarpment. It's real. It's actually science because basically there's nothing to stop a tidal wave in Texas. Everything is low elevation until you get to the balcony's escarpment. You know, it's kind of like a big bathtub. You know, you fill it up to a certain point. Once it reaches the top, that's where it's going to stop. So it's not going to go much further than 875 feet above sea level. But it will not be business as usual because our world will have changed so much. So and as you can see, the white areas represent the safe zone. This is in the Fort Worth area. Here is the San Antonio Austin area. The white represents the safe zone. For definitely sure, um, you know, it would be better to be on this side instead of on this side of 35. So as you can see, looking at the Gotham City map, there is a reason for uh, all of these symbols. It's obvious that this represents the Mississippi River, and you just take the highways and turn them around as they should be, and it becomes clear that uh, their intention is to strike the Mississippi River Valley. Uh, the staging areas will be along Interstate 65. As you can see, 35 is the main route, and it's basically safe except for a few places. The Louisiana sinkhole is real, and it's getting worse. We don't have much time. In times of universal deceit, telling the truth will be a revolutionary act. Of course, what people don't realize is that George Orwell was just using predictive programming when he says this. Now you can choose to bury your head in the sand or you can wake up to the reality of the world we're living in. We don't have much time left. They've warned us. They've warned us repeatedly of what they're going to do. It will not be an act of God. It will not be an act of nature. It will be an act of man when this crisis comes. Well, thank you for giving me an opportunity to share this with you. Shalom, friends. We also have earth changes occurring, and uh, we have uh, Anne and, and uh, Christina. Tell us about the latest in terms of what's going on with the earth changes and the uh, major sinkhole developments that are occurring, uh, the volcanism and all the other things that are happening to our planet. And do you have some update reports, uh, Christina? Well, we've, we've had some pretty major earthquakes in the, in the last week. In fact, the number of earthquakes is astounding, 572 in the past week alone, above a 2.5, we had a 7.6 in the Philippines today, uh, a couple in the uh, high sixes in the Jan Mayan region that's between Greenland and Iceland, just north of Iceland, which is a very rare spot for a big quake like that. Uh, 4.1 in Yorba Linda. We had also the swarm in Brawley. I think the highest one there was a 5.5. 7.3 in El Salvador, 6.6 six in Indonesia. And then all this was preceded by the large 7-7 in Russia about a week and a half ago. I've been watching some of the buoy movement, uh, NOAA, and uh, the Japan buoys and the Indonesia buoys have been going off for a few days now, showing that the ocean floor seems to be rising and pushing up. How much is it rising? Because you mentioned the number earlier today before the show. Yeah, I believe it was 110 meters in Indonesia. And then uh, yesterday we had a 5.5 five and a 4.6 off of Honshu, and just within the last hour there were two more there, a 4.5 and a 4.4. Four four. And it's really concerning, especially what's going on at the Fukushima plant. You and I didn't even have a chance to talk about this earlier because it was supposed to be fixed. They've been having problems keeping up the coolant level in reactors 1 through, through 3. It's being reported by Kyoto this afternoon that the water levels are still dropping, even though they flushed the pipes. TEPCO is unsure 
whether the flow will recover, and they don't know why it's not filling up the reactors. And it's at a level now. Well, I'll give them make a, a, a 90 to 95 percent guess that all it is is a gradual deterioration with neutron annealing of the seal. Uh, no matter how many pumps they put on there, if the seal for that reactor cooling pool eventually degrades, the pumps can't keep it. In fact, the engineers have talked about this, including uh, Ernie Gunderson, that once the seal breaks down, no amount of pumping or high-speed pumps will fix the problem. And when that happens, they've taken out the easiest bundles to remove, which are the newer ones. The older ones are very unstable. They're very hot. They're also damaged by these inch-long chunks of concrete down there that are blocking removal of these bundles that are probably twisted. And there's subsidence of the whole reactor cooling pool and these other buildings, so it means that the superstructure is twisted, so it's not going to be as a clear problem. They have to have cranes to pull out these bundles. What's likely to happen is that one or more of them are going to reach what's called critical temperature if they haven't fixed the problem, which they averted about six weeks ago. They, they actually had a D-day or D-minute when they expected that it would hit critical temperature at a certain time around 2 or 3 in the morning about a month and a half ago, and if it did, they expected to see these cooling pool fuel rod assemblies blow their cork like champagne bottles on the tarmac in Phoenix at 115 degrees. So what we're likely to see is a major release of radiation, as I've said already, and I predicted that it would happen this summer, sometime in July or August. It looks like we're on track because I'm seeing radiation spikes on my detector into the 70s now, and they're very short. They don't last more than so many minutes. And then you just drop back again. So what's this? You know, it's like a wave of radiation. But they did the 61st release of radiation from Fukushima. We also have sinkholes all over the planet. And, of course, Dan Dale's theory, as I mentioned in the earlier segment, it seems to make more sense that there is a something going on with actually planetary remodeling. So something's happening to the remodeling of the actual planet where sinkholes are developing all over the place uh, and subsidence that are near fault lines, uh, the area around Louisiana where this sinkhole is is actually connected with the same fault line system that goes out to the Macondo drill site and all the way up to New Madrid as well. So there's something really bad about to happen in these areas. It would sure seem that way. And, and just in the last few days, the helicorders from the New Madrid have really been going off, um, all of them really along the, the New Madrid fault line. Uh, I, I looked into it after someone had sent me an article from National Geographic talking about the uh, water weight of heavy rain possibly precipitating earthquake activity. Um, and this was published in 2009. And so it, when I went to the, the helicorders, I was really surprised at the amount of activity that's going on there. And that coupled with the fact that we have a lot of new plants right now that are having problems with tritium leaking underground. The so pipes are breaking under the plants. And where this has been the most noticed, is at the plant uh, about 40 miles north of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And you think of where the proximity is to the sinkhole, the Mercondo well, and the New Madrid. It's all along that line. And they've had a, a problem that's been worsening since December when it was first discovered. They had 22,000 picocuries per liter being measured in their groundwater wells. It's now up to 432,000. Right. Curious per liter. So something's really leaking under there, and they can't find the source. They're drilling new wells. Well, well the, the, reason why the reason that. why that's happening, and just give some theory behind this, as a chemist, what we're having is uh, the nuclear reaction of the Earth creates the batholith of oil. You take smaller molecules like methane and shorter chain hydrocarbons, and over millions of years, under nuclear reactions with radioisotopes, it literally catalytically creates longer and bigger chain molecules. And that's what's happening. These radioisotopes indicate the deep chambers inside the batholiths and the air chambers of the Earth itself, the tectonic plates, are releasing gases through fault lines because there's about to be a major shift. Well, okay. Um, they do think that um, there was a cover-up, apparently, in in, uh, in that area when, when, uh, when Texas Brine uh, drilled that sinkhole. And they didn't tell the public, but the uh, government gave them permission to fill the um, to fill their cavern that's in the salt uh, salt dome with uh, radioactive, which they're calling ra natural radioactive sources. Well, what they call natural radioactive sources uh, is that when you do drilling, uh, you get radioactivity of the scale 
and they call it a common byproduct of oil and gas exploration and production. And so they said that <laughs> they said that they gave them permission, but they didn't tell the public they gave them permission. And they took 20 cubic feet of natural occurring radioactive material and pumped it into the cavern and into another Texas brine salt cavern in another parish. So um, part of this, uh, I, you know, I agree with you. Part, part of it is the idea they're pumping in radioactive material. It's also part of the cover-up because I've known, I've dug back some forensic work going back to 1951 where they're told not to drill at the Macondo drill site. And it's because the oil industry has known this. And the reason why I knew is one of my friends, her name is Connie Musso. That's her maiden name. She's an oil engineer. She worked in Russia, all over the world. She's what's called a deep oil engineer. And her husband also is a senior oil engineer as well, works in Kazakhstan. They're close friends of mine. The oil industry is known for 60 years about abiotic oil. It's a big lie that it's from ferns and dinosaurs. It's a big lie. The oil industry wants to make sure you believe that this lie of, of want, that there isn't enough of it, but it's created by nuclear reactions deep in the bowels of the earth. Welcome back. Uh, and you mentioned something very important. It ties in with the uh, methane uh, batholith and, the, and the, these, these migration channels from the methane class rates that were disrupted at Macondo two years ago. Uh, and I believe it's connected with what's going on in Louisiana. Now they have also the overburden of this storm constantly sitting for now days over Louisiana, dumping more and more water, knocking off power to half the air state. Uh, and also the pressure of water combined with these, these new... Um, Fissures. Sinks, fissures and sinkholes, and they're seeing radon come up and methane. Tell us all about the, your analysis of what's going on and what this means. Well, apparently the, the, um, the oil companies want to mine methane. That's natural gas because oil and, oil and petroleum products are now, uh, they're kind of like bad words in the energy market. But natural gas is still okay. So, but in order to mine it, they have to go into these big math methane caverns where the methane is under pressure and ever since that that uh, blow up in the Gulf of Mexico now those that cavern was five miles down but they've noticed that there have been fissures that have been uh, in row in yeah, they've been going into the shorelines of Texas and Louisiana and, and Mississippi and uh, Alabama and they, they're they're deep and so these you know, the methane was disturbed. The, the cavern was dis disturbed. We know it was disturbed. And that methane is under a great deal of pressure. And so if it can find a migration channel, like through a fissure, then you're going to have methane linking out of the ground. And um, you're going to have, um, you're going to have like uh, swamp gas and things like that. Well, those things just automatically can um, cause a great deal of damage just by themselves. And if that cavern then leaks out enough of the methane, you could have a, a, uh, a methane explosion. Yeah. I think that uh, we're going to be surprised at the Earth changes. I'd say there's a high likelihood in the next, say, five years of a New Madrid fault uh, and or San Andreas fault, especially with the earthquakes that are happening right along the uh, California, Mexico border, right along the extension for the San Andreas. The Madrid is going off the scale. Talk about that for a moment because, um, and Christina, you can hop in here anytime because we need to have people understand that this is science. We don't have all the answers, but we're raising more questions because the earth changes are happening. Uh, we're having climate change. We're also having earth changes itself. The planet is remodeling. The planet is remodeling. We have the magnetic north pole racing from the Alaska-Canada border. It was right above the, the border there between Canada and Alaska, and it is now hitting very fast geolo in geological terms. I mean, we're talking about feet per year uh, towards Siberia. So it's, it's heading back to where it started, which would be above Greenwich, England. And um, that means that the core of the Earth must be rotating because that's, that's the only thing that's going to move the magnetic pole, is if the core of the Earth, which is a torus, a nickel-iron torus, if it, if, it, if it changes its angle of rotation, then that magnetic pole is going to move, and we know that it's moving. I mean, we, we're watching it move, the scientists are. 
We also right. have a change in the tilt of the Earth, and it's now uh, nine feet closer to Greenwich than it was. So we've we've had a slight change in the angle of the tilt of the Earth, and um, what we've been thinking is that this that this object coming into the uh, solar system is, is aggravating that, and that because we have the core of the Earth rotating and changing its angle of rotation, that it's um, that the crustal part, that's the part that we live on, the 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 uh, tectonic plates are slipping on the core, and we are expecting. Um, considerable tectonic movement in the coming years. Yeah, and, so, and syzygy, which is alignment of planets, perigee, which is a close uh, approach to, say, the moon, uh, increases the risk of that, as well as the equinoxes and high tides. So all those things combined increase the risk of a, of a major quake as we move within the next few weeks to the September 21st period. We're increasing the risk that we're going to get a boat and energy release. Uh, but these major, if you look at the actual seismic charts which you sent me uh, the link to, Christina, this is very scary looking. It is, a, and the, another factor too is the uh, the massive amount of water that we have that are, are coming off the Arctic zone. Um, historical melt, you know, that water is heavy. Um, NASA pointed out two years ago that the ocean floor is sinking from the weight of some of this water. That could be affecting uh, some of the crustal movement as well. Yeah, exactly. Now they say that that uh, 7.9 earthquake that occurred uh, didn't um, didn't create the tsunami, but it could have. It was a little bit deeper than you would expect a tsunami to be uh, generated. It was 20 miles down instead of uh, eight. And um, that was probably part of the reason. And also, it might have been a slip uh, fracture instead of a uh, uh, instead of a primary fracture that would have gone up and down and, and moved the ocean. That's why they issued the the tsunami warning. And there, when I read their news reports, they're they're a little unsure why there wasn't a bigger tsunami. I mean, they're, they're, they said it could have generated a big tsunami but it didn't and they're not quite sure why it didn't it was on a, a subduction zone and those those quakes that occur especially if they're a 7.8 are uh, are likely to create big tsunamis that will cross the pacific ocean yeah either something neutralized it in other words you got to figure an, an, an opposite force must have neutralized the tsunami Casas completamente destruidas que se traducen en millonarias pérdidas. Es el drama que viven los habitantes de Oak Beach en la provincia canadiense de Manitoba debido a un verdadero tsunami de nieve que arrasó con las construcciones de ese lugar. Vientos de hasta 80 kilómetros por hora provocaron el levantamiento de una capa de hielo desde un lago su rápido avance impactó directamente a las casas de Oak Beach. En algunas zonas, la nieve alcanzó los 9 metros de altura y se coló al interior de las viviendas, dejando a sus habitantes con lo opuesto. Muchas de las familias afectadas no contaban con seguros y habían sufrido el mismo episodio en 2011. La imagen corresponde a un vuelo realizado el miércoles 23 de enero anterior. Observe cómo en pantalla ingresa un objeto que se desplaza rápidamente debajo de la aeronave. El video fue captado por el piloto comercial José Daniel Araya, quien cuenta con más de 500 horas de vuelo. Íbamos a un vuelo a Coto 47 y vi el amanecer que estaba muy bonito, entonces realmente puse el, el celular nada más a grabar contra el windshield y a grabar la aproximación, que es algo que hago normalmente. Y aparte por el, el amanecer, me pareció buena idea. Lo puse simplemente y seguí asistiendo al capitán. Y de repente volví a ver a la cámara un poquito. Y lo vi cuando el objeto terminaba de, de pasar. Me asomé y, y no, vi, no vi nada ya. Pero después, como no vi nada, no le presté importancia. Cuando llegué a la casa lo vi y sí vi que había recorrido tamaño pedazo. Para él la imagen es elocuente y debe prestársele atención. Parece que sí pasa algo que es, no es normal, con un color de, diferente a lo que puede dar un avión. 
y a una velocidad que un avión a esa altura no, no es normal. Para buscar una respuesta a lo ocurrido, acudimos al astrónomo José Alberto Villalobos y al estudioso del fenómeno OVNI, Alexis Astúa. Villalobos calcula que el objeto en pantalla puede tener un largo entre los 7 y los 10 metros. Su desplazamiento eventualmente alcanzaría los 3.600 kilómetros por hora, siete veces más que la nave desde la cual se captó la imagen, pero podría estar ante un reflejo producto del lente de la cámara. Considero más reflejo por el hecho de que no está definido, o sea, no... No se le ve, digamos, una, una estructura de avionetita pequeña o de un ultraligero, sino más bien como, como una manchita de, digamos, de ventanilla que este, se refleja en la, en la superficie del suelo. Por su parte, Astúa no descarta que sea un objeto, pero también secunda la teoría del reflejo. O sea, en el video se puede ver algo que pasa, pero no podemos definir si se trata de un objeto sólido o no. Sin embargo, ya yo he visto casos eh, anteriormente de fotografías que me envían y esto, que son efectivamente reflejos de, de focos de luz muy fuerte, más ahora que tenemos el sol eh, en pleno verano, entonces podría tratarse de un reflejo eventualmente. El avistamiento en la zona sur no es extraño, ya que de esa región del país hay reportes constantes. Sí, sí, sí. Casas completamente destruidas que se traducen en millonarias pérdidas. Es el drama que viven los habitantes de Oak Ridge Beach en la provincia canadiense de Manitoba debido a un verdadero tsunami de nieve que arrasó con las construcciones de ese lugar. Vientos de hasta 80 kilómetros por hora provocaron el levantamiento de una capa de hielo desde un lago su rápido avance impactó directamente a las casas de Oak Ridge Beach. En algunas zonas, la nieve alcanzó los 9 metros de altura y se coló al interior de las viviendas, dejando a sus habitantes con lo opuesto. Muchas de las familias afectadas no contaban con seguros y habían sufrido el mismo episodio en 2011. La imagen corresponde a un vuelo realizado el miércoles 23 de enero anterior. Observe cómo en pantalla ingresa un objeto que se desplaza rápidamente debajo de la aeronave. El video fue captado por el piloto comercial José Daniel Araya, quien cuenta con más de 500 horas de vuelo. Íbamos a un vuelo a Coto 47 y vi el amanecer que estaba muy bonito, entonces realmente puse el, el celular nada más a grabar contra el windshield y a grabar la aproximación, que es algo que hago normalmente. Y aparte por el, el amanecer, me pareció buena idea. Lo puse simplemente y seguí asistiendo al capitán. Y de repente volví a ver a la cámara un poquito. Y lo vi cuando el objeto terminaba de, de pasar. Me asomé y, y no, vi, no vi nada ya. Pero después, como no vi nada, no le presté importancia. Cuando llegué a la casa lo vi y sí vi que había recorrido tamaño pedazo. Para él la imagen es elocuente y debe prestársele atención. Parece que pasa algo que es, no es normal, con un color de, diferente a lo que puede dar un avión y a una velocidad que un avión a esa altura no, no es normal. Para buscar una respuesta a lo ocurrido acudimos al astrónomo José Alberto Villalobos y al estudioso del fenómeno OVNI Alexis Astúa. Villalobos calcula que el objeto en pantalla puede tener un largo entre los 7 y los 10 metros. Su desplazamiento eventualmente alcanzaría los 3.600 kilómetros por hora, siete veces más que la nave desde la cual se captó la imagen, pero podría estar ante un reflejo producto del lente de la cámara. Considero más reflejo por el hecho de que no está definido, o sea, no, 
no se le ve, digamos, una, una estructura de avionetita pequeña o de un ultraligero, sino más bien como, como una manchita de, digamos, de ventanilla que este, se refleja en la, en la superficie del suelo. Por su parte, Astúa no descarta que sea un objeto, pero también secunda la teoría del reflejo. O sea, en el video se puede ver algo que pasa, pero no podemos definir si se trata de un objeto sólido o no. Sin embargo, ya yo he visto casos eh, anteriormente de fotografías que me envían y esto, que son efectivamente reflejos de, de focos de luz muy fuerte, más ahora que tenemos el sol eh, en pleno verano, entonces podría tratarse de un reflejo eventualmente. El avistamiento en la zona sur no es extraño, ya que de esa región del país hay reportes constantes. Sí, sí, sí. Hi everybody, today is January 19th, 2014. This should alarm people. It got so cold in Norway that fish that were swimming froze in place. They have an image here. Yahoo has another image. I guess because the fish were frozen in the water that the birds couldn't even feast on them. There's also been report of moose being frozen instantly in the water. You know what this reminds me of is that woolly mammoth that they found frozen up there in the Arctic that had the buttercups, flowers, that it was eating upon when it was instantly flash froze. So how cold does it have to be to be flash frozen like that? The struck an area near Tokyo was the result of some unusual weather. They say a type of thunderstorm called a supercell created the twister. Such storms contain rotating updrafts of air and they can be deadly. 
The winds whipped up in mid-afternoon. They left a trail of debris in the city of Koshigaya. More than 60 people were injured. About 600 buildings were damaged. Roughly speaking, the cloud wasn't even 500 meters above the ground. That's really low. The funnel measured somewhere between 50 to 100 meters across. It was one of the largest tornadoes ever in Japan. Scientists at Japan's meteorological agency have surveyed the damage. They've determined the tornado's strength. They say it measured one or higher on a scale between zero and five. The scientists say a level one tornado packs winds of about 120 to 175 kilometers per hour.
Hello, I'm a whole lot of Glenn, a.k.a. How Water Fire. How War News for the 3rd of January 2014. 6014, if you're a Masonic Temple lover trying to hide the facts behind um, global warming, and there are no facts because there is no global warming. All right. Frozen out. 98% of the stories ignore that icebound ship that was frozen out in Antarctica, you recall, with all those researchers a aboard, uh, spent Christmas uh, in Antarctica. Um, but that ship uh, was on a global warming mission. Ah, uh, yes. Hundreds gathered to protest global warming. Ah, uh, yes, indeed. Here we go again. A group of climate change scientists were rescued by helicopter January 2nd after being stranded in the ice since Christmas morning. But the majority of the broadcast news work, uh, networks uh, reports about the ice locked climate researchers never mentioned climate change. No, they never mentioned that they were on a climate change mission. No, indeed. How humiliating that would be that they were on a climate change mission and their fucking boat got frozen in the ice. <laughs> the Russian ship Academic Shakakalaski <laughs> was stranded in the ice uh, while on a climate change research expedition. Yet nearly 98% of the network news reports about the stranded researchers failed to mention their mission at all. 40 out of 41 stories, 97.5% on the network morning and evening news showed uh, since December 25th failed to mention climate change had anything to do with the expedition. In fact, rather than point out the mission was to find evidence of climate change, the network often referred to the stranded people as passengers, uh, trackers, and even tourists without a word about climate change or global warming. So there you go, the cover up again. Uh, they can't prove uh, climate change, of course, because uh, in uh, where I am, in Winnipeg, Manitoba, it's been colder than fucking Mars, and where they are, they got frozen in the fucking ice in Antarctica. Go fucking suck your climate change and shove it up your fucking ass, you fucking scammers. So there you go. 22 crew members stayed while the ship uh, for the time being as the scientists and researchers were rescued according to CNN the ship has enough supplies for a very long time so they'll be sitting there uh, trying to uh, prove to everybody there's climate change while they're frozen in the fucking ice until springtime uh, three rescue attempts I guess it is springtime in Antarctica right now isn't it maybe they'll be just frozen there forever stupid bastards Three rescue attempts have been thwarted by growing levels of sea ice and weather conditions. I'll let you read this bullshit. Hell War News, I'm out of here. Stick your climate change up your fucking ass. Floating ice. Are you not being able to talk today, Dixon? That's right. I'm going to have a tough time on TWIP. What you're looking at is called pancake ice because the ice that freezes on the surface of a river that also has a ton of salt water underneath it, but it rained recently, so the top surface of the water is still fresh, is you're looking at the eventual contiguous melting, or freezing rather, of the entire surface of the Hudson River. And if you look up further from the bridge at George Washington Bridge, you can see you can't see it from here, but we can see it crossing the bridge today. The upper reaches of the Hudson River, as far up as you can see, is frozen all the way across. You know, there's the George Washington Bridge. Correct. So now, these, these ice pancakes are floating downstream. They right? are, because the tide is going, the, not just the tide is going out, the river always flows in that direction, okay? That's the constant flow of the river. I but see. because it's tidal, at this point, it's estuarian, this afternoon you will see the ice flows going in the opposite direction. Oh, well, we'll have to include that, right? I think so. Now, so every six hours, the tide changes, right? That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Dixon. Mm. All right, Dixon, it is now two hours later. Correct. And the pattern we are seeing now is that the ice, first of all, there's more ice. There is. The ice in the middle has stopped moving. Barely. Yeah, I see a little bit of movement, but you're right. It, essentially, it stopped. And the ice near the coast is moving upwards. I think you could just barely see that slow motion. You can. Now there's a sewage treatment plant south of here. That's right. Let's see if we can
catch that on the one video. One of the here. largest sewage treatment plants in the world. In, there in it is the sticking States. out into the river. And it discharges effluent that it's treated yes. into the Hudson River. And what you might be looking at, although I'm not sure, is a I flow see. of the effluent upstream giving motion to the pancake ice. That Otherwise see. it would just be sitting there. That's correct. So the the uh, flow of the water out downstream has stopped. Correct. Is that normal? Well, it's only normal when there hasn't been a lot of rain and most of the water column is salt because the ocean fills up the gaps. So the, the river essentially looks as though it's at the same level no matter what. And if there's been a lot of rain, then the top layer is fresh water. And if it hasn't been a lot of rain, then the top layer is all salt coming in from the ocean. All right, so how long will it remain static like this? Uh, for another about an hour, and then the tide will start moving up the river. Oh, well, let's catch that. So, Dixon, what time is it now? It's 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock. And what's happening here? Well, the tide has changed. And now the entire river surface is flowing upstream. Yeah, it may be hard to see, but... It's flowing north. It is. So we caught the tide change. We did. Otherwise, it could be 12 hours and this you wouldn't catch true. it, right? That is exactly right. Depending on what day. You got it. So the ice flows will go back up the river tonight. Yeah. Notice that along the shoreline now, the flow has stopped. Do you see that? I do. It's not going anywhere. So there's about, I guess, a 50-foot so area of stop. coming stopped. out of the plant might have been the reason why it was flowing before. The effluent would tend to go along the shoreline? It would go north. They, uh, they empty it mm -hmm. on that side of the building. And so, yeah, you can see now that in interior, the ice is in moving the up. In the middle of the river, yeah. it's going up. It looks like a little more packed than before also. Well, it's starting to accrete because it's still cold out there. Accrete means come together? Yes. And is it going to form one big sheet tonight when it freezes? If it stays at this temperature, you bet it will. I've seen the river like that already. Has the river ever been frozen over so that you of could course. walk across it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it has, it has, it has. But there's too much, there's a lot of motion in the water here, so it tends to break it up. All right? If you go further north, above um, Nyack, the river gets really thick sometimes. And there's a wonderful story called Winter's Tale by John Halprin. It's a takeoff on uh, mythology. And it describes the Hudson River as being completely frozen. People are out skating on it and having parties and ice fishing and all kinds of other stuff. Thank you for your insight, Dixon. You're very welcome, Vincent. <laughs>
Yeah, right. It is November 24, 2013 on a Sunday at 6 p.m. Pacific Time. Up next, why have 10 major volcanoes along the Ring of Fire suddenly roared to life? This is by Michael Schneider of The Truth Winds, dated November 24, 2013. There's the Ring of Fire. Well, 10 major volcanoes have erupted along the Ring of Fire during the past few months. And the mainstream media in the U.S. has been strangely silent about this. But this is a very big deal. We are seeing eruptions at some volcanoes that have been dormant for decades. Yes, it is certainly not unusual for two or three major volcanoes along the Ring of Fire to be active at the same time. But what we have and what we are witnessing right now is highly unusual. And if the U.S. media is not concerned about this yet, the truth is that they should be. Approximately 90% of all earthquakes and approximately 80% of all volcanic eruptions occur along the Ring of Fire, and it runs directly up the west coast of the U.S. Perhaps if Mount Rainier in Washington State suddenly exploded or a massive earthquake flattened Los Angeles, the mainstream media would wake up. Most Americans have grown very complacent about these things, but right now we are witnessing volcanic activity almost everywhere else along the Ring of Fire. It is only a matter of time before it happens here too. Sadly, most Americans cannot even tell you what the Ring of Fire is. The following is how Wikipedia defines the Ring of Fire. The Ring of Fire is an area where a large number of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions occur in the basin of the Pacific Ocean. In a 40,000 kilometer, 25,000 mile horseshoe shape, it is associated with a nearly continuous series of oceanic trenches, volcanic arcs, and volcanic belts and or plate movements. It has 452 volcanoes and is home to over 75% of the world's active and dormant volcanoes. An easy way to think about the Ring of Fire is to imagine a giant red band stretching along the perimeter of the Pacific Ocean. And yes, that includes the entire west coast of the U.S. and the entire southern coast of Alaska. Okay, folks, I'm going to stop right there. There is more to the article. If you'd like to read more, I'll put a link at the bottom. Thank you. Take care and be safe.